Good afternoon, Congressional Climate Campers. Welcome to a bonus fifth installment of EESI's Congressional Climate Camp. I'm Dan Bursett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. As always, everything we do and produce, from briefings to fact sheets to podcasts, is freely available and accessible online. And also, as always, the best way to stay up to date and never miss a thing is to visit us online at www.eesi.org and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Our original plan for Congressional Climate Camp was four sessions held on the last Friday of the first four months of the year. We started in January with process and specifically budget and appropriations. Then we delved into policy and examined the emissions profiles of major sectors of the US economy in February. March was a little bit of a history lesson about past climate policy development efforts with some political science tossed in about the importance of bipartisanship and compromise to a healthy functional Congress capable of delivering equitable, inclusive climate policies. And a few weeks ago, we concluded with an overview of four areas that we think are especially ripe for emissions reductions and adaptation benefits, building energy codes, uh, mass timber, agriculture, and nature-based solutions for coastal resilience. If you missed any of our previous series, uh, our full webcasts uh, are archived online, again, at www.esi.org, and summary versions are available as episodes of our podcast, The Climate Conversation. For those congressional climate campers who have been with us for a few months now, you've heard us tease the session today. We knew almost from the start of the series that our original plan would need to evolve uh, and include a focused discussion on the budget reconciliation process. Nobody knows for sure how the climate policy debate will play out in the coming months, but it is a safe bet that the buzz about budget reconciliation as a vehicle for climate policy and infrastructure in particular will get louder and louder, sort of like what our new cicada friends are capable of doing. And so that brings us to today. A week, we are a week away from Memorial Day. The work period that starts after that long weekend and runs through July 4th will be pretty intense. Speaker Nancy Pelosi has already stated her intention for the House to vote on an infrastructure bill by then. So our goal, with the help of our two experts who will join us in just a moment, is for this session to be informative and helpful, just in time to be an aid for staff who will be very, very busy very, very shortly. Thinking about today, I've tried to put myself in the shoes of that staff person on Capitol Hill. I work for a member of Congress who serves on one of the authorizing committees. We have a bill that fits broadly in the working definition of infrastructure espoused by leadership. And my boss wants to know how our priorities fit in the package coming together and what needs to change to make that possible. Of course, this has been on everybody's mind for some time, at least as far back as the passage of the American Rescue Plan, which was also passed using budget reconciliation. But a lot of unknowns will start to be known pretty soon and momentum can build surprisingly quickly and no one wants to be unprepared for that. As a reminder, our session today, including summary notes, will be posted online at www.esi.org. And a condensed audio only version will be of each congressional climate camp, including today, will be available as an episode of our bi weekly podcast, The Climate Conversation. We have a lot to cover, and you can participate in our discussion by asking questions. You can send us a message on Twitter at EESI online. You can send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. Even if we get more questions than we can possibly answer, we will do our best and follow up to answer every question submitted during Congressional Climate Camp. So let's get down to it. Uh, each of our panelists today will make short presentations and then we will kick off a discussion, a longer discussion than we've normally been doing during Congressional Climate Camp. And now I get to welcome our first panelist. Molly Reynolds is a Senior Fellow in Governance Studies at Brookings. She studies Congress with an emphasis on how congressional rules and procedure affect domestic policy outcomes. She is the author of the book, Exceptions to the Rule, The Politics of Filibuster Limitations in the United States Senate, which explores the creation, use, and consequences of the budget reconciliation process and other procedures that prevent filibusters in the U.S. Senate. Molly's current research projects include work on oversight in the House of Representatives, congressional reform, and the congressional budget process. She also supervises the maintenance of vital statistics on Congress, 
Brookings long running resource on the first branch of government. Molly, welcome to the session today. I can't wait for your presentation. Thanks, Dan. It's really good to be here. Um, it's really good to be here with Zach, who you'll hear from in a little bit. Um, but what I'm going to do today um, is to try and provide a little bit of kind of big picture context for thinking about budget reconciliation um, historically and in the context of the contemporary legislative process. And so I have um, a couple of slides that I am going to um, share my screen so you can see. So hopefully um, everyone can see my um, my slide that says four things to know about budget reconciliation. And that's where we're going to um, we're going to start today. Um, and so the first um, thing that I, I want to sort of emphasize is that budget reconciliation as conceived of in the 1974 Budget Act looks really different than what budget, how budget reconciliation came to be used in the 1980s and the 1990s. So in 1974, when Congress passed the Congressional Budget Act, that um, act called for two budget resolutions every fiscal year, one early in the year before the appropriations process, and then a second one by September 15th. It also provided for a reconciliation process that would happen alongside that second budget resolution. The idea was that Congress might not want to set binding ceilings and floors on how much it would tax and spend as part of that first budget resolution early in the year. Rather, that first resolution, the drafters of the Budget Act imagined, should be a, a target. Congress should then make whatever fiscal decisions it was going to make, and then it would write a second binding resolution just before the start of the fiscal year. But if existing laws weren't in line with those new binding levels in September, Congress might need to act quickly before the start of the fiscal year. And that's how we got the special expedited procedures that the Budget Act um, provides for reconciliation bills moving to the Senate. So we know that um, part of what makes the reconciliation process so powerful is the fact that reconciliation bills cannot be filibustered. And that, it, it was this, this um, this need to potentially act quite quickly, that is why um, uh, that those expedited procedures got put in, in the Budget Act in the first place. But it, it became clear pretty quickly that um, this idea of moving quickly for Congress was too quick, um, that, that Congress couldn't possibly keep to this, um, this calendar. And, to the extent that reconciliation was meant to also help committees reduce um, expenditures in their jurisdictions, it became clear pretty quickly that committees weren't actually that interested in, in doing that. And there was little reason for the budget committees to try and force them to do so. So um, for fiscal year 1981, we saw the reconciliation process moved to be in connection to the first budget resolution. And then for fiscal year 1982 is when we get the first use of the process that looks more, of like, more like what we think of today in terms of substantive legislative change. So then we have this period in sort of the 80s and the 90s, and this is my, my second bullet point here, that the, the way the process was used in the 80s and the 90s really also does not look that much like it was, it's was it been used more recently. Um, and in the 80s and 90s, we were generally seeing the process used for deficit reduction. Um, and there was a degree when that was happening to which basically all of the committees were expected to share in some share the pain of um, of making cuts, um, and so ever the the idea was that one of the ways that reconciliation was powerful, in addition to the protection from the filibuster, is that it would basically require committees to buy in to um, to the this shared goal of um, of deficit reduction. And if you, I'm gonna. Go to the next slide here. If you look here, these are some tables um, from the Congressional Research Service that run from um, 1989 uh, through 2015. And you can see that in sort of the, the earlier period here, the, the, the 80s, the 90s, that um, large numbers of committees were tended to be named in the in the reconciliation instruction. So the way the process was being used was again this idea that we were going to sort of the Congress was going to had this goal, they were going to try and um, uh, achieve deficit reduction, but they were going to they were going to get um, lots of lots of committees to um, to, to share the, the pain um, in um, in doing so. 
Um, I don't, I, I want to emphasize that even in this sort of model of using the reconciliation process, we have evidence, um, Dan mentioned um, my book, and this is one of the things I look at in the book, but there's evidence that congressional majorities were using the process um, to try and advance goals that were important to them as a majority party, even in this model of the reconciliation process. But again, it looks, um, it looks different than the way the process was used, say, to help pass the Affordable Care Act, to um, uh, to achieve the the um, the Trump tax cuts, that sort of thing. It also means because we had this model where lots of committees were making uh, were um, involved in the process that sometimes we got large bipartisan majorities for reconciliation bills. So I think today we think of reconciliation as this this way to do things on a, on a partisan basis. But this is a table that um, just tracks the final Senate vote margins on reconciliation bills from 1980 through 2017. And if you look sort of again in that um, in that 80s and 90s period, you see that, that some of these things did get um, did get um, large bipartisan um, majorities. Where we ended up um, in kind of the, the 2000s and the 2010s is moving to this model where reconciliation became more of kind of a one neat trick um, for uh, achieving uh, party defining priorities. So again, for helping to pass the Affordable Care Act, um, Republicans failed attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, passing um, the, Trump, the Trump tax cuts, and then Today, um, I would say we're, we're this year, we kind of find ourselves back in the middle a little bit. We know from having looked at the American Rescue Plan um, that that is another, that was another instance where Congress kind of went back to this 80s and 90s model of enlisting lots of committees to, um, to do things um, uh, as part of the process. But we're also, um, the process is seen as this way to, um, to accomplish things that in this case, Democrats really want to get done and that the filibuster might um, be preventing them from, um, from doing. So, um, the third point that I want to make is that because the process has become more important for congressional majorities to try and achieve their major policy goals, we've kind of stretched the boundaries of, of, of the process and we've ended up with, in many cases, less certainty about what is and is not allowed um, uh, to be done through the reconciliation process. Um, Zach is going to talk, I think, a little bit more about this. Um, and I'd encourage you, um, I think some of the resources that we shared for this um, session uh, uh, include discussion of kind of what topics have been covered by reconciliation bills in the past. They are wide ranging. Um, but the sort of contextual point that that I want to make here is that as the process has borne more policy priorities, we have to we have ended up asking more and more questions about how to fit things um, in in the box. Um, in addition, um, uh, the another consequence of asking the process to bear more policy change is sort of the more uncertain you are that something is reconcilable, the more likely you are to end up with a real policy problem in terms of how you construct a policy to get through the process rather than simply political problems. Um, so I think that the minimum wage um, in the American Rescue Plan is actually a good example of this. So there was there were questions about whether that could be done through the reconciliation process. The, um, ultimately, the answer was no. But so when that had to come out of the bill, it didn't sort of take the entire rest of the structure of the bill as a policy question down with it because it was a kind of discrete um, priority that was in an omnibus piece of legislation with lots of other things. As we, in other cases, when the process has been, um, or when folks have tried to use the process to, uh, to accomplish specific policy goals, we do end up um, uh, with more uh, challenges um, in terms of the possibility that you might unravel an entire policy proposal. The last thing I'll say about um, sort of why um, the process I think has become more complicated is because of the um, uh, expansion over time in the number of things that we use the tax code to try and accomplish. And so we know that um, uh, uh, revenue provisions are something that um, can um, can generally be done through the reconciliation process. And this is just a, a graph from, um, from GAO that is meant to give you some sense of the degree to which tax expenditures, which is that dotted line, um, have increased over time. Um, and 
again, as the tax code has become um, a more important vehicle, I think, for trying to achieve lots of policy aims, there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg question here. So how much of the reason we do things through the tax code is because you can do them through the reconciliation process versus how much does the reconciliation process bear more things because we do things through the tax code. Um, that's a, an interesting knot to unravel sometime. But again, this is another reason, I think, another piece of context that's important for understanding where we are right now. And then the last thing I'll say before I um, turn it over to um, to uh, back to Dan, who will introduce Zach, is that it's also really important to remember that the rules um, are a big constraint here, but they're not the only constraint. Um, one um, important um, thing to remember is that um, there are other um, there are other features of the process that don't have to do with things like the bird rule that um, that can limit how it's used. Um, I think. Perhaps the most important one of these is time. Um, going through the reconciliation process, both in terms of writing a bill and then taking it through all of the hoops that are um, related to moving it on the floor is a really time consuming process. Um, and if you are a majority that has other things you also want to use floor time for, you have to kind of make some choices about how to allocate that. Um, it's also the case that um, I think one of the things that um, Zach might talk a little bit about is the sort of discretionary mandatory um, spending piece here. How do you make discretionary spending look mandatory? Um, and there's some interesting lessons from the American Rescue Plan on that front. But it's also worth remembering um, that uh, there are elements of the, the reconciliation process that can ask committees to give up some power that they have. Um, this is um, part of the, the story from the early 80s in terms of um, the use of um, the reconciliation process um, for discretionary spending, part of sort of why that was a, a thing that was tried and that um, did not uh, uh, Congress did not keep doing is because the appropriations committees really did not like um, the authorizing committees infringing on their jurisdictions. And so just remember that, again, we're going to talk a lot about the rules. We're going to hear a lot about the rules as this moves um, as a, a subsequent reconciliation bill might move through the process. But the rules are not the only thing that limits um, or, or shapes how um, a reconciliation process might shake out. So I will stop there and I will stop sharing my screen. And I will turn it back over to Dan. Thank you, Molly. That was a great presentation. Um, lots to build on uh, with Zach's presentation and then our discussion. Um, before I introduce Zach, let me just make a quick reminder that slides and materials will be available online. Um, and that includes some supplementary materials. Um, both Molly and Zach have passed along some additional resources um, that we think would be helpful uh, to congressional staff and um, folks in the stakeholder and advocacy communities too as they figure out how they navigate this. Um, I will now introduce Zach. Zach Muller is the Deputy Director of the Economic Program at Third Way, a think tank based uh, here in Washington, D.C. At Third Way, Zach leads a team that specializes in developing innovative policy uh, and regularly consults with policymakers and the media on the federal budget process uh, and other issues of economic importance. Zach got his start in D.C. working on the Democratic staff of the Senate Budget Committee under Chairs Patty Murray and Kent Conrad. Uh, Zach earned a degree in economics from the University of Florida and also a master's degree in economics from the University of Virginia. Uh, welcome to the panel today, Zach. I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Dan, and, and thank you to e EESI for having me today. Let me share my screen and get to my slides. All right. Um, so basically, I, my role here today is to kind of talk to you a little bit more about what's in and, and what's out of uh, budget reconciliation. And you know, to that extent, it's, it's a lot about the rules. And when we're talking about the rules, frankly, it's, it's all about the Senate. This is a very Senate-focused process. Um, the rules are, are really where they're most binding in the Senate here. Um, just very quickly, reconciliation requires a budget resolution to, to start. So, you know, the instructions that are in the budget resolution that are given to authorizing committees must be followed. And that means following the committee, the committees of jurisdiction. Um, that means meeting a savings target or not going over a cost target um, that may be in the, in the reconciliation instructions. And further, these rules are, are not only are they binding on the base text, they're also going to be binding when you're on the floor. 
Uh, amendments to the bill itself must be germane. Uh, the amendments cannot increase the deficit unless you're moving to strike a provision. Uh, and you know those, they're still subject to all the other rules uh, related to budget reconciliation, including the Bird Rule. Um, so just very briefly on the Bird Rule before I get in and out, because this is the thing that I think most people talk about. The Bird Rule itself is a surgical point of order against extraneous matter. Now, what the heck does that mean? Surgical. It is a surgical point of order. Surgical means only the offending material is, is removed. So this does not take down the whole bill necessarily. Point of order. A senator on the floor would raise a point of order against a provision uh, in, in, the, um, in the text or would threaten to raise such a point of order and thus it might get worked out in advance. But the point of order has a, a supermajority threshold, which means the point of budget reconciliation by not you know, getting to, to get around the filibuster becomes moot when you have to have a point of order that has that higher threshold. And extraneous matter is defined as, it's, it's six little tests, um, most are objective, um, one is subjective, and these kind of create the boundaries of uh, a good chunk of what you can do. But at the end of the day, it's really about spending and, and it's about spending in tax policy. It's about budgetary changes. Uh, and that's, that's going to be just a key thing going forward. So what is clearly allowed under budget reconciliation? I classify what's clearly allowed uh, in kind of in four categories, four broad categories. The first category is, is rates and dates. These are changes to marginal tax rates. These are changes to the date in which a policy uh, may be expiring. So uh, changing a rate could be moving the top marginal tax rate back up to 39.6%. Um, it could be extending an expiring tax provision. It could be extending an expiring UI provision. Um, these things are kind of clearly allowed. Uh, tax policy is, is generally quite permissive uh, and quite able to be allowed under, under budget reconciliation. Uh, but I stipulate that you shouldn't be too specific about your, uh, about your tax policy. So it, a climate example would be, you know, a, a tax credit for electric vehicles would be allowed, but something that might be too specific and might run, start running into the rules changes would be a tax credit where only like Tesla vehicles qualify. I'll get into a little bit more about this in, in a little bit. Um, also things that are clearly allowed are expanding, are expanding or trimming existing mandatory spending programs, as long as it's not social security. So you could expand some, you could expand Medicare by um, lowering the eligibility age. Um, you, could, you could find ways to save money in the Medicare program. Uh, that, those things are kind of clearly allowed. And then you're allowed to establish new direct spending programs. Um, new spending, uh, we, you know, we saw a lot of that under the American Res in the American Rescue Plan. Um, you know, these are things like new block grants, new mandatory spending. Um, you, create, you could create a, a $10,000 training voucher, uh, things like that. But there are limits on the process. Um, you know, we'll get into this more, I think, probably in the Q&A. But, uh, you know, a lot of people want to put a lot of policy in a spending program. You can do this. You can't use the money for A, B, and C. But the more and more limits that you put on spending, the more and more policy that you're putting into it, you create a, a situation where things may start to, you may start running into parliamentary problems. So let's talk about the things that are clearly not allowed. You cannot change Social Security with um, budget reconciliation. You, uh, you cannot do things that do not produce a CBO score. Uh, or uh, that do not score in, in reconciliation. So this means it's gotta be about spending and revenue. You can't add new points of order. You cannot really make changes to the civil or, or criminal code. Regulatory changes, um, you know, saying a, a power plant, you, you know, banning the use of, of coal power plants, for example, that would be a regulatory change and that would not be allowed under budget reconciliation. Um, provisions or policies that come from the wrong committee are, are not allowed. So if Environment Public Works does not get a reconciliation instruction, or some, or the Finance Committee tries to do something that is in that committee's jurisdiction. You're going to run into problems, and that will get stripped out. And then, what's also clearly not allowed is long-term deficit increases uh, without an on-committee offset. So this means 
you know, a lot of policy has to be designed in a temporary basis so that it does not increase the deficit in any year outside of the outside of the reconciliation bill. Um, I say uh, an on committee offset because uh, that this provision is, is governed on a title by title basis. So essentially, the finance committee cannot pay for another committee's priorities in the long term. In, in simple in simple uh, language there, um, but then there's everything in between. Look, there's a lot of different things that go on here, and there's a lot of gray area. Uh, one of one of the bird rule tests is uh, it's called the merely incidental test. Is does the budgetary change that exists is that viewed as being merely incidental to the underlying policy? This is argued in front of the Senate parliamentary. This is a picture of uh, Elizabeth McDonough in the lower right hand corner, uh, and the parliamentarian is going to make a ruling or or going to make advisement based on established precedent. Um, those arguments are going to be done behind closed doors. We may not, we, we the general public may not even know what the result is uh, of these arguments, except for if you look closely at the bill text uh, and see things have changed or things have removed. But practically, look, what you are arguing is can you success, you know, can you say what you are doing, your policy change is about spending or revenue? And you have to tie it to that point at every at every at every juncture to be successful. Um, there are a lot of edge cases and, and things that kind of inform things that are that tend to fall out because of the because of this challenge. Um, if you're targeting a, a single entity, um, that that can be viewed as being merely incidental. Um, this this goes back to the example I, I gave earlier that a tax credit for electric vehicles might be okay. But a tax credit that only affects Teslas uh, would be too specific, as only one entity is benefiting. Um, providing general waivers, exemptions, um, those those have been viewed as uh, as things that are that tend to be merely incidental. And then changing a, a regulation on an industry uh, will have some challenges. Of course, you can you know be creative in how you construct this. Changing a regulation may be out, but making a tax. If, if an industry or some or, or an entity does something, maybe okay. So it's all about being creative um, to, to how you design a policy. Now, this might mean you're not designing your preferred policy, but you're designing it to fit under budget reconciliation. And just my last slide, there's just a few lessons from the American Rescue Plan that, that staff need to know about. Um, we, you know, I, I tend to look at budget reconciliation from one particular point of view and a very narrow point of view. And then we saw the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 come up and a lot of things, a lot more things were allowed than, than I guess we had initially in, in anticipated. So direct spending from an authorizing committee is more permitted than per previously thought. A lot of the American Rescue Plan Act had a lot of direct spending, which means that, you know, for climate policy, for infrastructure policy, a lot could be allowed as long as the authorizing committee is the one that's spending the money. Uh, it's typically easier to fill up an existing pot of money that you know exists in law that has restrictions on it than um, creating a new pot of money, a new program with restrictions. This goes into the fact that, you know, the more and more policy you pile on to a direct spending program, the further, it, it further you get down a road where it's entirely possible that the parliamentarian is going to ask you well, why is that one line? Why is why is this regulation important to the underlying spending? So you just have it's easier to fill up a, a pot of money that's existing than create new a new pot of money with restrictions. Um, the American Rescue Plan had particular challenges with single target uh, single target provisions, uh, which is very relevant for infrastructure. Which means I think it will be very difficult to get things that look like earmarks. Uh, in in infrastructure, fix this road, fix this bridge. Those are going to have huge challenges uh, going forward. And then the last lesson um, that I would give to staff from the American Rescue Plan is making sure that your the provisions, the bill text you're working on has pretty clean jurisdictional boundaries. Um, in the Senate, bills out in the normal process tend to get referred to by a preponderance of, of jurisdiction. So if you're doing something on tax policy, finance gets it. But you know it may be the case that, well, okay, there's probably a little bit of policy 
you know, if it's, if it's on the environment, it may be, there's maybe a little bit of policy that would, that would normally live under EPW's uh, jurisdiction. Well, when you're designing the policy here and because it's going through committee markups, the, the policy uh, that overlaps multiple committees needs to live within their needs to live within the title of where the where the policy is actually um, meant to be so it, you just have to be really really careful uh, and, and thus you know be very very careful about where the, the jurisdictions um, of an individual committee may lie um, so that is those are my lessons there and let me stop sharing my screen Thanks, Zach, for a great presentation. Um, we will now transition to Q&A uh, and discussion. And so I'll invite Mal, oh, there she is, uh, turn her screen back on. Um, we actually just got a question um, from the audience that I think may be good just to pause um, to ask. Um, Zach, on one of your slides, you had a photo of Elizabeth McDonough. She's the Senate parliamentarian. Um, the question from the audience was, where does the what does the parliamentarian do? Um, who selects her um, and, and sort of what her role is. Um, uh, the parliamentarian uh, serves at the pleasure of the Senate um, and she is generally responsible for providing advice and guidance on the rules of the Senate. Um, she made some headlines in, uh, around the time the uh, American Rescue Panel Plan was coming together. She, she made a, a controversial ruling on the minimum wage Zach or Molly, could you speak a little bit more about, um, or just say a few words about sort of what role she functions, how the parliamentarian um, works with the majority uh, and the minority um, right in the Senate right now? Yeah, so um, I'll start and then um, Zach can, can add. So I think he gave some important context in his uh, presentation in terms of, um, in the, the context of reconciliation specifically, um, the parliamentarian is tasked with um, advising senators on whether a particular provision in a reconciliation bill does or does not comply with the bird rule. Um, this is a, a process that is affectionately uh, referred to as the bird bag. Um, things that are removed as part of that process are affectionately referred to as bird droppings. I like puns, turns out the Senate does too. Um, and so that's that's a, sort of a key responsibility that she has um, in this context. One thing I think is important to, um, since you mentioned, Dan, that um, the parliamentarian made some headlines um, in, in earlier in the year, um, the part like, I think we might talk about the, parliament, the parliamentarian the most when we're talking about reconciliation, but she has other functions in the context of the Senate. And the fact that she has other functions, including things like advising on which um, uh, committee's bills should be referred to and on uh, questions of committee jurisdiction, there's value in having um, an entity that is seen as an honest broker by everyone in the legislative process um, that, again, extends beyond simply her role in the reconciliation process. So as kind of an institution within the institution, I think that's important to remember that if she, like we might talk about her the most in this context, but she has other jobs um, and that it's, it's um, that everyone in the Senate um, uh, benefits from having someone who everyone sees as a neutral arbiter of a number of different issues. And I would just add, I, I think the media fascination with the Senate parliamentarian, in my opinion, is probably net negative because at the end of the day, it's political actors that are making a decision and they want to blame you know, it's, it's kind of like blaming the ref in sports or blaming the umpire specifically in baseball for someone that they're just doing their best job to call the, to call the balls and the strikes as they see them. Um, you know, this person has immense institutional knowledge and, and is a consummate professional. This isn't a person that is necessarily a political actor in their own right. So I think that's just an important thing to recognize. Well, thanks for that, um, and thanks for the question from the audience. Um, okay, so um, now we get to have the discussion, and um, you know we're we're talking about this at a point, like I said in my introduction, um, the Congress is going to debate infrastructure, um, and um, it seems like that's going to start happening pretty quickly. And you know, Zach, you your presentation in particular sort of laid out sort of what's allowed, what's not allowed, and what's in the middle. 
Um, for someone who's thinking about how to approach reconciliation with the goal of getting their boss's priorities included in the mix, if they have something to start with that's written like a regular bill, what are some of the differences between a normal bill, an authorizing bill, and what that has to look like to be, a, to be successful in a rec reconciliation process? What are the, the types of things that might have to change is it just how it affects revenue, how it affects spending, or are there other sort of like, are there other sort of construction uh, elements that make an authorizing, uh, make authorizing text different from reconciliation text? So let me, let me just start here and say, there are a lot of different things that make an authorizing bill an authorizing bill. But I, I think what's, what's key here is if your bill was already a tax policy bill and it was purely a tax policy bill, you're already starting from a position where you're, you're more likely to be able to make an argument that this can get into budget reconciliation. Assuming that when you put this into the, the comprehensive package that the committee is putting together, you don't you know, make it be too expensive or, or, or anything like that. But if you're starting from something that's more Re regulatory or, or, you know, those sorts of things um, are authorizing a new program, you need to make sure that, you know, it's not something that needs appropriations in the traditional appropriations process to come and backfill uh, and, and, and provide your money. Um, you need to make sure that there's direct spending provisions, direct spending language uh, within, your, within your bill to be fully reconciliation ready. Um, I would suggest staffers who want to do that, make sure that they look at um, the American Rescue Plan and the, lang the legislative language that was used in that for a good chunk of the, um, the direct spending that was there. And then just realize you've written a bill and you've probably written a bill that you think is really great. and You've done a lot of stuff in good faith to make sure that, ah, okay, I've, I, I realize that it's going to touch, you know, four different, four different old pieces of legislation. I've dot, you know, I've crossed my T's, I've dotted my I's. You have to recognize that you may start needing to make compromises and things that you want and you view as, oh, this was really important. This, this regulatory provision, which prevents some gaming, uh, companies gaming the situation down the road. Well, you may run into situations where the parliamentarian is gonna say, well, are, is this necessary? Do you need this in there? Or you may be dealing with, leadership or the committee and the committee may go, well, we just, we just don't want to run that risk. So, or, or it may conflict with other things. You recognize that you just, it may not be the exact same bill at the end of the day. So I'll okay. add, I'll yeah, add please. two, two things. So one picks up on sort of Zach's comments both here and his presentation about um, direct spending. Um, and again, I will just emphasize that like, while one of the lessons from the American Rescue Plan is that we sort of saw more um, direct spending um, move to that bill than we, we might have otherwise thought, that um, there may also be a limit on how much the appropriations committees are comfortable with authorizing committees continuing to sort of take things that would have otherwise been uh, programs that would be sub like subject to annual appropriations and convert them into direct spending that is reconcilable. So I don't think we have a as a, it's sort of a like institutional political question, I'm not sure we have a, a great sense of that. The other thing I remind folks of is the implications of um, the 10 year window um, uh, for reconciliation bills. So um, provisions that um, uh, increase spending or um, cut taxes um, are, uh, unless they're fully paid for beyond the reconciliation window, that's also a potential bird rule violation. And so you might find yourself um, having to sort of do something over a different time horizon than you would otherwise. Uh, this is um, the the uh, Bush um, tax cuts, the parts of the Trump tax cuts. The reason they sunset is because um, of the the ten year window um, issue. Um, so that that's just another um, another thing to um, to keep in mind. Great, thanks. Um, so then we've we've talked a lot about American Rescue Plan, and we're talking about sort of this in an infrastructure context. Um, how many times can Congress actually use reconciliation? Is it something that's bound 
to a fiscal year? Is it bound to the lifespan of a budget resolution? Is it a calendar year? Is it a Congress? Molly, how, how frequently could Congress go back to this well if it chooses? And Zach, I'll definitely give you an opportunity to comment as well. So there, there are two pieces to this, um, to answering this question, I think. There's a sort of what do the rules permit? And then there's a what does the calendar as an actual thing that binds people <laughs> uh, permit. And on the, on the what do the rules permit, um, under guidance from the parliamentarian that dates, I believe, to the early 2000s, um, the notion was that each time Congress did a budget resolution, that budget resolution could um, be followed by up to three reconciliation bills, one related to spending, one related to revenue, and one related to the debt limit. But if you wrote a reconciliation bill that touched any one of those three areas, that sort of counted as your bite at the apple. And it's, in practice, pretty difficult um, if you want to sort of do anything. Uh, it, it can be quite difficult to do anything more than a, a straight like tax cut bill that doesn't touch revenue and spending. Um, so we've seen relatively few years with actually more than one um, reconciliation bill attached to the same budget resolution. What happened um, uh, a month or so ago, um, is that the Senate Democrats sought an opinion from the parliamentarian on whether they could do a revision to the budget resolution for fiscal year 2021, which is the one that they adopted early this calendar year to create the reconciliation instructions for the American Rescue Plan. Could they go back and revise that budget resolution and would that um, uh, uh, permit them to do another reconciliation bill under the umbrella of the fiscal 2021 budget resolution? The Senate parliamentarian said yes, though I am I remain a little unsure exactly what the contours of um, her what her yes um, uh, means. So uh, this brings me to sort of my second point before I turn it over to Zach, which is that like the the rules may say something about the number of times um, uh, uh, Congress could try to bite at this apple, um, but equally as important is the amount of time um, it takes to do a reconciliation bill and the sort of strategic questions about what do you want to try and put in one versus split into two and if you split it into if you split something into more than one and it takes you longer than you think to do the first one do you ever really come back to the second one and there's lots of um, so those are those are questions that have to do with priorities and um, log rolling across issues and just the the um, degree to which floor time, especially in the Senate, and frankly, um, in this moment of lots of priorities for a new narrow majority, uh, that that's also, um, I think, as binding a constraint on what we're talking about as the rules. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything Molly uh, said, especially this last point about political floor time. Um, everyone needs to realize that to do budget reconciliation, you deal with the Senate voterama process twice. For those of you that don't know or haven't lived it, uh, Senate voterama. Lucky for you if you've never <laughs> lived through a Senate Lucky voterama. for you. Um, Senate voterama is a situation because because there are time constraints built onto the budget resolution and, and budget reconciliation. Um, that's what kind of gets around the filibuster. At the end of the time, it's over. But at the end of the time, it's over means all the pending amendments, and there are hundreds, uh, are, are up for a vote, and you could just vote continuously. And so at that juncture, the entire Senate floor is kind of governed by unanimous consent. And it's, it's a unanimous consent agreement for when, when do all 100 senators get so tired of voting that they are, they're calling it quits. And that's an, it's a really tough process. It's a tough process on staff. It's a tough process on the members. And it eats up a lot of time. And so, and, and folks take a lot of difficult political votes, which is another, another constraint there. So that's part of why I thought at the beginning of, so after Democrats won the Georgia runoffs and it became a 50-50 Senate, and Democrats held the House, the Senate, and the White House as a result, I thought three, reconcili three attempts at reconciliation using the FY21 budget resolution, the FY22 budget resolution, and the FY23 budget resolution would, would have been possible before the next election, before the November 2022 election. Um, 
whether or not the parliamentarian rules that you can revise 21, revise the 21 resolution. Um, I still think three is probably the most that, it, that this can bear over two years. Um, but that's just my personal speculation, not a, this is technically what they could do. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, Voterama goes all night. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a crazy environment. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's, I'll just say that like it, again, to like go back to my opening comments that try to put this reconciliation moment in broader political context, in a Senate where there are far fewer opportunities for senators to get votes on amendments that they want generally the voterama becomes like an even more painful process because people look around and say i have this amendment that i want to offer um and i don't think there's any other time i'm going to get to do it so i'm going to take the one chance that i have but all your 99 colleagues are also thinking the same thing and that's part of what makes it as painful as it is and i think it's gotten worse over time yeah I think it's almost like it's almost like um, you know a kid eating all of their candy on Halloween night. It's you, you've been like I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for this candy, and then all at once, great! I have all these different options, and you eat yourself sick. Is there another way to eat Halloween candy? I'm not aware. <laughs> I um, guess not everyone just portions it out for a little bit at a time. Yeah, I'm going to remember that this year when Colin brings all this Halloween candy home, I'll be like, no Voderama tonight. Voterama, we'll be parcel it out. Um, and also, like Molly, I think what you were saying is, you know, at ESI, climate is, you know, it's it's top of our list, but Congress has lots of other priorities, right? I mean, there's a very good reason why the American Rescue Plan, plan came first, um, because that was sort of the immediate. Um, so I think that's a really important point for staff to remember um, as well, that um, Congress has lots of things on its plate, literally everything on its plate, and it has to choose which priorities it, it prioritizes. Um, I would like to just quickly remind everyone that if you have a question, there are two ways to ask it. You can follow us on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. Um, Zach, we'll start with you on this one because you used to work there. Um, the Budget Committee. What is the Budget Committee's role in all of this? What are their staff doing? And are, are they available as a resource to other staff or... What are they doing with all of this? I mean, they obviously have a, a huge role to play, and I think maybe their importance generally is overshadowed sometimes by the Appropriations Committee at certain times of the year, or some of the authorizing committees at certain times of the year. Yeah, so it's important to remember that budget reconciliation requires a budget resolution to, be, to, to, to get kicked off, and the budget committees are the ones that write that budget resolution. That budget resolution contains the instructions that give the authorizing committees the ability to do that. So the political pressure on the committee to, to write a budget resolution that can meet what the majority wants uh, dictates a lot of, of what can happen. Um, and you know, an individual member's preferences uh, on the budget committee can steer and change how it gets through, how it gets through committee. Uh, in 2017, there was a big debate uh, for, for the budget resolution that set up the, the Trump tax cuts. There was a big debate inside the committee of whether or not they could get a majority based on a $1.5 trillion tax, uh, uh, $1.5 trillion uh, uh, instruction, uh, net instruction. So, you know, who is on that committee can, can make a big difference. From a staff point of view, um, you know, the, the budget committee contains a lot of the process experts on this. They contain the experts on where all the numbers need to be and where they may add up at the end of the day. Um, so if you are a staffer, you know, it's good to be in touch with your corresponding budget committee expert, whoever runs, you know, if, this, if, you're, if you're the environment staffer, it's important to be in touch with who is of your party in running the environment portfolio over at your committee. Um, because they can, they're the ones that are going to be knowing best about what's, what's going on. Uh, and keeping those lines of the communication open is something that I always recommend to congressional staff. The only thing that I will add is um, this question was about the budget committee specifically, and Zach has done a great job of sort of um, answering that. But the part where he was talking about um, the needing to get a budget resolution out of the budget committee, um, 
also, uh, because the majorities are so narrow in the House and the Senate, like that's also going to be a constraint on what that resolution might look like, especially if we're talking about a resolution that is also um, uh, also is meant to actually set some top lines, uh, because I think that in there are um, uh, there's the potential for um, disagreement uh, within the Democratic caucus from different wings of the, the party about what um, sort of what things like the overall size of the defense budget should be. Um, and that there is a potential, again, because we have fewer and fewer things that move through the legislative process, they all bear more of the political conflict. So the idea that like there are things beyond just how does the budget resolution set up reconciliation that could get caught up in that debate, I think is also an important thing to remember. Yeah, just one thing on this and this, because this is really important. The prior budget resolution that was used for the American Rescue Plan was the FY21 budget resolution. We were already halfway through, roughly halfway through fiscal year 2021 when that was utilized. If, if Democrats are gonna use the fiscal year 2022 budget resolution, that would be the first budget resolution after the expiration of the discretionary spending caps, which means it's a budget, it's a live budget resolution for determining the start of the appropriations process, which means it's just that more important. And we, um, we had our, our first congressional climate camp budget and appropriations and stimulus, um, we had a CRS analyst uh, and a friend at the Bipartisan Policy Center come and talk to us about sort of the regular budget process, um, appropriations, and sort of the role that the budget resolution plays in all of that. So if, it, and there was a lot of discussion on spending caps actually during that. So um, if anyone in the audience was just intrigued by where Zach was going with that, we actually have a whole congressional climate camp and you, on And it. you should be, it's really important. <laughs> it is really important. Um, and uh, so anyway, I would definitely encourage anyone to go back and read the, at least read the notes, but um, uh, Kari and uh, Franz did a great, uh, job um, presenting on these topics too back then. Um, I'd like to um, sort of, we're getting close to our three o'clock stop time. And so um, I'd like to sort of ask a couple last questions. Um, this one is more about, you know, you, you all have, the two of you have done a, a wonderful job explaining this um, and, and helping us understand sort of what this looks like and what the dynamics are. Um, are there quirks there are lots of quirks with the project, uh, process. Uh, but are there little things in the process or there pieces of information that we haven't already covered that for a staff person sort of going into this process with their boss's interests um, in mind, um, trying to advance their priorities? Are there quirks of the process? Are there things that we haven't talked about yet that they should just know going in? And Molly, maybe we'll start with you this time. Yeah, so I will um, I will say something that actually comes back to something that Zach said earlier um, and that has the potential to like interact with what feels like the a possible like pretty fast timeline here. So in your opening comments, Dan, you were talking about what Pelosi has said about when um, the House is gonna vote on um, an infrastructure package. And one thing that is true, particularly for things that are less clear fits in the reconciliation box is that sometimes you have to iterate over a policy idea on how exactly to get, if you, you, so you try to take the policy kind of through the clear front door, that turns out to not fit in the reconciliation box. So you have to find a side door or maybe even a second side door or the back door. And so knowing that the if you have a policy goal that the first idea you have may not be um, allowed under the process and that you might need to try and find a second way to do it, but while also knowing that the whole train is moving really quickly, I think is, um, is an important thing to remember. The, um, the issue of um, the individual mandate in the ACA repeal is a good example of how like first Republicans tried to go through the front door with a straight repeal of the mandate and the parliamentarian said that that was not permissible and so they ended up going through a, a side door where they set the penalty for not having health insurance to zero. Um, and so that's just an example again of how like the first thing they tried didn't work so they tried something else and so just kind of knowing that um, but also remembering that if the train is moving really quickly that like it's in your interest to try and get it right the first time, but that is not unusual for um, it to um, 
uh, it to, to be um, wrong. Um, and then the, the other thing I'll say is just like, this stuff is really complicated. <laughs> um, I have um, one of the one of my favorite um, things to, to show people in the context of talking about reconciliation is I have some documents that are from like the development of reconciliation bills um, in the in the 90s that are now at the National Archives. And um, one of them is a document prepared by the House Budget Committee, um, where they were trying to um, speculate about what are possible what were going to be possible violations of the bird rule when the bill went over um, to the Senate. And there are several of them that just have these boxes with like this provision next to the box. There's just like a series of question marks like I don't know. Uh, but again, these are people who do the who are who are experts and who do this this for um, as as their job. And so just knowing that it's it's hard and it's complicated, um, I think is also an important reminder. And then, you know, I'll just flag that, you know, staff need to realize that given the fact that this is a, it's a, essentially a democratic only exercise, um, it's going to be a lot of what is in and what is out is governed in a political process held by leadership and held by the White House. And so as best as you're trying to represent your boss's interests, you have to recognize that you have to do that. It, you have to do that step to make sure that your leadership staff understand that your boss cares about this. And you, you have to do that kind of political legwork within the caucus to make sure that you understand, you know, to make sure that leadership knows uh, it's supported by not just new Dems, but new Dems and progressives. And so that you can build that coalition to say, this should be in the bill. That being said, the more and more expensive your provision is because everything will kind of be locked in at the beginning in the budget, in the uh, budget resolutions instructions, the more expensive your provision is, the tougher it is going to be to make that case. And, you know, what are you trading off? What are you taking out to put your provision in? Um, and that will be on a committee by committee basis that that decision will be made. So talking with your, your authorizing committees, committee professional staff will be really important uh, as well. Yeah, that's, I, um, we talked about Votorama. Now it's time for cl cliche a palooza that, you know, staff really need to understand that it's not just the ends, it's also the means, right? And that, you know, there are multiple ways to skin a cat. Um, and also that you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and there are, you know, it's, um, in some ways it feels a little bit like the, um, it's a, a problem in search of a solution. So those are all of the cliches, but those are my sort of extrapolations of some of your um, bits of advice from that. Um, we are just about out of time, but I would love to give each of you an opportunity to um, plug your work, uh, share you, some additional resources that you or your colleagues at Brookings or Third Way um, might have on the topic. Um, and Zach, maybe we'll start with you. Um, other resources that you've either authored or that you think fondly of that you would like staff to be able to, to use as a resource? Great. So I, I wrote a paper recently uh, this January about the role of the parliamentarian in this process and how we can use budget reconciliation to help the American, work, American workers recover. Um, that should be posted uh, as, a, as a resource available online. Uh, uh, I know I sent that one over. And then I'll just also flag that um, the Center on Budget Policy Priorities and the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget both have very good entry level uh, refreshers or, or, or short papers on budget reconciliation. Um, I know even though like I pay attention to this more than the normal person, I still go back to them from time to time. I think that's, I think they're just really, really helpful and, and worth reading. Um, I would second everything um, Zach said. Um, I would say if you are, um, if you're interested in getting like a deep dive into the history of reconciliation, um, there is um, there is some of that in my book, but you really don't need to read that. Um, and the other thing I will say is that um, my other invaluable resource um, every time I need to is anything produced by the Congressional Research Service on reconciliation. Um, I have an entire file on my computer of CRS reports related to different parts of the process. I showed you one table um, pulled from um, one of those reports on the number of committees named the instructions over time and just really those, um, the, uh, the team over there who um, works on, on this stuff is really top notch. And so um, I would, particularly for um, the congressional audience, I would say they are a great resource to reach out to as well. Great, well, that is, um, uh, I 100% endorse that as well. It's a great advice. They're 
pretty amazing. And when I was talking about that first installment of Congressional Climate Camp, we had a CRS analyst with us and she's the best. Um, great, present, great presenter too. Um, we are just about out of time. I think this topic could be the subject of multiple briefings, um, but um, what I took away from the two of you, um, first of all, thank you so much for your expertise and your insight and your experience, your recommendations, your guidance. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, um, for staff people, it may not be possible right now to understand everything. Um, but I think the two of you did a wonderful job helping to orient them, um, hopefully for navigating the process successfully. Um, and, uh, so I thank you so much for making time today for us, um, and our audience. Thank you so much, uh, Molly and Zach. Um, I would like to just take a quick moment, uh, to share uh, a preview of what we are planning on in June. Um, we are going to take a little bit of a break around Memorial Day, but um, much like Congress, we're going to come back um, in June in a big way. Uh, we are going to be looking um, at the energy system. We are going to be looking at proposals around a national climate bank. Um, we have a really busy slate that we aren't quite ready to notice yet, um, but keep your eyes uh, peeled because they will be coming out shortly. And if you really don't want to miss it uh, and you want RSVP as quickly as possible, the best way to do that, as always, is to visit us online at www.esi.org and to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Um, we have a lot of great stuff coming up and I would hate for you to miss it. Um, I will ask my colleague, Dan O'Brien, to put our slide up with our survey link. Um, if you have uh, the ability and, and two minutes to take our survey, we would really, really appreciate your feedback. We are always doing our best to improve our congressional pro education programming. Um, I'm not sure how we could possibly have improved today's session uh, with Molly and Zach, um, but whether you had, maybe you had a tech issue, maybe my audio wasn't coming in. Um, we really do read every comment that you submit. And so if you do have a moment, um, we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, and uh, it means a lot when you take time to do that. And um, just lastly, I would like to thank everyone at ESI who helped uh, make today possible. I mentioned Dan O'Brien, big thanks to him. Thanks to Omri, Anna, Amber, Savannah, Sydney, uh, and our interns, uh, Jackson and Ashlyn for uh, helping with today as well. They're um, two of our summer interns and, and they're already making a big impact on our on-bill financing work and our development work. So thanks to them. Um, we will go ahead and end it there. Uh, Molly and Zach, once again, thank you so much. Um, thank you for our audience for joining us today. Um, if you liked what you saw, everything is available online. You can also go back and revisit the entire Congressional Climate Camp series. And I hope everyone has a great end of May and a nice Memorial Day weekend. And we will see you all back here in June. Uh, and stay tuned. We'll be getting those briefing notices out as soon as we can. Thanks so much. Take care.